Good evening, and thank you all for coming. I welcome you to Pen Out Loud, a year-round conversation series presented by Pen America and the Strand Bookstore that amplifies diverse voices and convenes vital conversations with authors, poets, journalists, artists, and activists. Tonight, we're here to celebrate the paperback release of the holy original hybrid mem memoir, Survival Math, Notes on an All-American Family by Mitchell S. Jackson, who will be in conversation with Imani Perry. Originally published in the spring of 2019, Survival Math was named a Best Book of the Year by Time, Esquire, and Pace Magazines. After discussion and a reading, we we'll open the floor for a short Q&A. Books are available for purchase, and a brief and formal signing, signing will conclude the evening. Mitchell S. Jackson's debut, The Residue Years, received wide critical praise. He is the winner of a Wadding Award and the Ernest J. Gaines Prize for Literary Excellence. His honors include fellowships from the New York Public Library's Coleman Center, the Ford Foundation, and the Center for Fiction, among others. His writing has appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's, The New York Times Book Review, The Paris Review, The Guardian, Time Magazine, Esquire Magazine, and elsewhere. Jackson teaches creative writing at the University of Chicago. Amani Perry is a Hughes Rogers Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. She's the author of six books, including the award-winning Looking for Lorraine. She lives outside Philadelphia with her two sons. Please join me in welcoming Mitchell S. Jackson and Monty Perry. Good evening, everybody. Hey. Is this on? It's on? OK. OK. They, they don't really All right, there we go. There we go. I hear myself now. Um, hey. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I really okay. appreciate this. Um, they asked me who my, my dream list was, and you were on the dream list. Well. Uh, so, so, so dreams, you know, I really feel fortunate. Well, um, that's mutual, and um, it's wonderful <clears throat> to be able to talk to you and to have this book, which is, um, I know you hear this a lot, mm -hmm. but it's really extraordinary in content and composition mm -hmm. um, and in deeply layered. So I have a ton of questions. Okay. But I want to start with the title. Okay. Because um, <clears throat> you go through a, a kind of uh, extended exploration and meditation of uh, a survivalist yeah. versus a hustler. Yes. And the journey is, in some ways, right, it's the survival math. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about what, <clears throat> what, that, what that calculus is? Um, well, that's, that's uh, one of the, the survival, I guess, um, areas that I was thinking about is, well, I think I should back up and say okay. that I'm always trying to take something from my personal experience whether it be me directly or it's people that are really close to me, and then kind of dilate it out, but really to try to put it in context. Mm. And so uh, the kind of, this idea of a survivalist versus a hustler um, was really me trying to figure out what was the difference between kind of different levels of uh, guys who, um, you know, were trying to figure out how to make a living. Right. Um, and so one thing I realized about myself is that I was never willing to go all the way. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, then I also was thinking about my, my uncle. Um, I have an uncle who in the 1970s was like the kingpin around the, the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But by the time that I had a relationship with him, which was in the early 90s, he had already struggled with addiction for a very long time, and he was doing kind of petty uh, hustles, you know, he'd be stealing hubcaps mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, getting a little bit of something and trying to sell it, or some soap or anything, mm -hmm. and I was thinking how um, that's like scrambling, right? Like, you don't, yeah. that's not really a hustle, it's like you, you, you hand to mouth, you kind of living day by day, and then I was like, okay, well, what's the next level of that? Um, and to me, it's a person who is like trying to survive. Um, and uh, I think that to reach the kind of ultimate hustler, there's a kind of sacrifice that you have to make in your spirit, mm. your, your emotional life, um, and then 
also physically, right? Like I think if you call yourself a hustler and you're a real hustler, that means one, you're gonna be tested because you're, you're going to make s- some money. Right. And then what are you gonna do when the test comes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, I mean, among the things that are so, that are, make this book so important is that you're from Portland. Yes. Right? <laughs> and Portland, the image of Portland we have is like Portlandia, right? right. Like it's, you know, yeah. and, and so there's a, and you trace from the beginning of the book a kind of black genealogy yeah. through Portland that is, um, is invisible to the larger society, but also for those of us when we go visit Portland. Right, yeah. You don't see yeah. black Portland. Right. Or even where it once was, or the displacement. So, and I, you know, you it, and the way that you move through it, it's, I, I was gonna, I was thinking about the words described. I was gonna say cinematic, but mm. it, that doesn't adequately capture it because you move through history and space at the same time. Mm. So, like you're going to places, and then you have a record of generations. And, yeah. um, <clears throat> and so I, I'm, I, you know, so Portland is in some ways a character. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And why, what is important for you? I mean, I know it's home. Yeah. But about your story being in. Uh, I think probably that because we don't exist in the larger imagination. Yeah. Um, and, and one of my, uh, the, the kind of life, lifelong objective of my artistic life is to leave a record of the people who have come in contact with me mm-hmm. so that, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, y'all keep me in print. Uh, there will be, people will know that we existed and like, here's our struggles and here's our triumphs. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sad, but there's, a, there's such a dearth of writers of color that I know yeah. from Portland. Um, I probably couldn't name five, you know, nationally prominent mm-hmm. writers of color. So I think it's, it makes it even that much more important. Like, I mean, I've been in New York almost 20 years now and I've never written about New York. I'm like, there's plenty of people to write about New York, but um, right. I just feel like I need to stay connected to home. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's a story that's, and, it's a, and as a consequence, it's, it's a migration story too, because yes. you talked about the migration yeah. from Alabama. That's right, Arizona. our people from yeah. the same state. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, which is, and I, I you know, I, it was part of what was um, profound about it for me is also, though, like the the details that you offer about the drive to move and mm-hmm. and class transitions, which you don't often get. You know, so like we tend the stories that we tend to get are like stories of upward mobility. Yeah. Right. Or stories of like going from the land to the city. Yeah. Right. But you have a more complicated story, right? There's like these kind of movements in and out of certain kinds of security and vulnerability and over the course of generation. Yeah. You know, I think a lot about my great grandparents were the first ones to move from Alabama to uh, Portland. And they were upper to middle class. Mm -hmm. Uh, My great great grandmother's parents owned property Mm-hmm. Um, they all, all they college they sent all of their daughters to, to college, so they were college educated in the 1940s. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they bought a home, they owned a home. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all of these things, and then somehow, not somehow, but it, it like it declines yeah. over the generations. And so we went from upper class, or they went from upper class to you know my grandfather's been uh, middle class for all of my life, but then he, all his children have fallen yeah um so i i you know one of the things is how does that happen well and i think i I mean that's for me that's part of what's important about this book too because that's common right like we black folks tend not to be able to do social class reproduction (laughs) like we do (laughs) down a lot right because of how deeply unequal the society is so it's you know it's 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 real yeah. It's real. I also kept thinking about your book as a, um, I kept thinking of the word the consul roman, the coming of age of an artist. Yeah. Yeah. And the way in which you're an educator appears in it too. Because yeah. you're always, so you'll take a word mm-hmm. and you trace the genealogy of the word and yeah. then you use the word to explain a feature of this, of this architecture of the people 
you you came of age with. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that I don't often read from is the survival math, and I was thinking, uh, I mean, I was reading, I was at a, a talk, so I, I can't really claim this as a genesis of my idea, but I was at a talk with this guy named Eric, who now I can't remember his name, Chicago. He runs the poetry program in Chicago, like the slam. Anyone know this guy's name? Eric. Uh, anyway, he was talking about gangs. Okay. And uh, he was saying how, uh, how many aspects of nationalism that gangs had, were using. Um, and I, I mean, it, it was just offhanded how he said it, and then I started to think about all the ways in which we were trying to reproduce a kind of uh, um, patriotism. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I started to think like, oh, well, what if I thought of gang members as like nationalists, uh, which made me start reading Renan and, you know, what mm -hmm. happens, how do we build a nation, mm -hmm. and then who are the heroes in that nation? Right. Um, yeah, so, so, I, so I try to take a thing that is outside of my personal experience, put it with a thing that is a part of my personal experience mm -hmm. and then s see what happens. And that's like in every case, in every one of these essays, be like, oh, I had this personal thing that happened. And here's this thing that I, you know, as an educator or as a, just a, a now an adult reader, like I've come across this, but I haven't seen it through this lens. Yeah. 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 Do you want to, are you, would you read from that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Damn it. <laughs> I had the pages all American Blood, uh, yeah, 164, 164. Uh, so American Blood started with me thinking about my mother, who used to donate blood as a side hustle. Um, and she, uh, I would call her and she would say like, yeah, I was out, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of tired today. And I was like, why are you tired? Oh, because I went to go donate. I'm like, how much did they give you? They gave her 60 bucks. I was like, mama. I'll give you the 60 bucks, like, let's not do this. So um, then I started thinking about the idea of blood, blood donations, where did it come from? I didn't know anything about the history. Uh, and um, I'll read uh, a little excerpt from that. So this is me calling my mom. Uh, another time, another call. So tell me, what's your idea of a patriot, I said, whom I'd say a patriot is someone who believes in their country, who's loyal to their country, mom said. A patriot is someone who, whether America is right or wrong, they ride with them. Someone who'd rather live in America than anywhere else. Come to think about it, a patriot is almost like being a mom. Because as a mom, sometimes you know your child is wrong, but you still stand by them. You stand with your child through the good and the bad until the final outcome, she said. Some people see America as a mother, but what if it's the other way around? What if America is the child the patriot must protect? So this is my mom, and then now I'm putting, trying to put it with an idea. Um, priceless, every damn part of my mama's blood, and don't nobody forget it. For fact, it's both priceless and equal in biology to everybody else's on earth, but for some, her blood was not, could not, and will never be equal to the 20th century compatriots who marched in those first Red Cross lab hubs during World War II. For a great many donors bestowed more than human blood. They gave American blood. American blood was born on March 5th, 1770 on Colonial Boston State Street. American blood is made of what George Mason declared as a man's natural rights enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. American blood is part of Thomas Jefferson et al's self-evident truce. All white men were created equal and owners of inalienable rights. American blood is Walt Whitman's America, center of equal daughters, equal sons, all alike, endeared, grown, ungrown, young or old, strong, ample, fair, enduring, capable, rich, perennial with the earth, with freedom, law, love. It's John O'Sullivan defining the country's predestined quest for land. American blood is made of those beloved two-crusted apple pies invented by the Pennsylvania Dutch and ratted blankets stitched to quilts to keep out the cold. I keep going. And then I say, 
But, for mo but most of all, to bleed true American blood, my mama would have had to been white. And what's a cold-blooded fact of our great nation's history, there was a point in time when my mama's mama and the adult Negroes of her era were banned from blood blank contributions. And check this, though he was a catalyst for blood donating and given prime opportunities by powerful white folks, not even the fair-skinned Dr. Drew was allowed to break that ban. The policy, of course, didn't sit well with the black press, the NAACP, and Negro sympathizers, so they took to protesting. Then in 1941, the Red Cross announced they'd accept black blood, accept it, and segregate it. I'll call that apartheid blood. Yeah, so um, I didn't know any of that. Very little about, you know, Dr. Drew and him creating the blood banks and the blood being segregated. And I did not know that the, I mean, I guess maybe somewhere I'd read that it had come out of the World War I efforts. Mm -hmm. But um, to, to find out that history uh, and then to, to kind of compare it to my mother's idea of what is a patriot. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, because I, I mean, it, it's, it's part of what's so stunning is that there's like this is vast knowledge right in each section of the book but you don't lose the thread ever right okay, so you get so. right like you go and so it's is it it's a process of discovery right yes. you you hone in on something and you do the research and then constitute it in the fabric of i'm yeah. sorry i'm asking craft questions but i'm yeah, just kind of blown like away questions. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i think one thing i'm i'm always doing uh i think uh you kind of start in what's your strength, you mm -hmm. know? Like if, if I were a sprinter, like I probably would have a certain kind of, you know, crouch in my starting blocks. And to me, that's a kind of personal experience or anecdotal experience. And mm -hmm. so most everything that I start with starts with that. And then there's the seed of an idea, yeah. which is gonna lead me to some kind of inquiry. But I'm, I'm usually gonna start in what I figure is a is a strong place and also mm -hmm. something that's connected to me and I'm gonna land like that as well. And then yeah. how I get there, you know, there's the discovery. Well you I, and you quote Morrison in the book where she talks about yeah. knowing where the where the where the book is gonna end. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah which yeah. you can see. Um I, I did I was very moved by the way that you both talked about your mother and talked with your mother mm -hmm. through the book. Um and one of the most potent initially, I, so you talk you, you talk about um, her her journey with addiction as a marriage. Yeah. And I first initially thought of MC Lights. I cram to understand you, Sam, which is about that's the whole theme, mm -hmm. right? Um, but then I thought, and so I was thinking of it as a metaphor. But then I was like, well, wait, what? What you? push is like, well, what do, is a marriage actually, right? right? Yeah. Maybe it's not a metaphor. It's yeah. a real, um, and yet, um, there's so much care in how you handle her, yeah. and all of the stories of people yeah. you love. And I'm like, how, how, for you as an artist, mm -hmm. what's the process, you know, of the, both the revelation and the protection? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I think of this book as a, it's kind of like the companion to the residue years, yeah. especially in terms of uh, writing about my mother. Mm -hmm. um, and so because I had done that work, but I'd fictionalized it, and she had already gotten used to talking to me about those experiences, even okay. though previously I was fictionalizing it. I think uh, we had a kind of um, a working relationship that mm -hmm. she she felt really comfortable, okay. and she had already been public. You know, we'd made a documentary about it mm -hmm. and already written about it. So I think she had a, a level of comfort and then trust. Like she knows I'm not out right. to 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 get her. Um, um, and that essay, I remember someone asked me to write something for Mother's Day, mm. and I. I was like, I don't have no happy Mother's Day stories. Mm -hmm. so I'm gonna I'm write about this. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing about that essay is the memory that began it turned out to be false. So the, the I guess the aesthetic or maybe even moral choice was whether or not to change the whole thing or keep, 
you know, so it was really me like trying to figure out how I'm going to work through that this is the way that my mind works, that there are memories that I've had so long that they have replaced what is true. Um, and then what happens when you find out that that's, that's not the case, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. both of them are true then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Cause there's a reason your mind creates. Yeah. The, right. Yeah. Um, which, and, and relatedly you talk a lot about gender yes. in various ways. And there's a sentence that I'm, a, I'm going to mention because okay. having spent a year being Pushed on the sentences that are provocations. Okay. I'm gonna ask you about your sentences. Yeah, and yeah, I got one in here too right, for you. Right. <laughs> but the, you know, the one about boys needing their fathers. Oh my god. And then god, you go into yes. girls needing their fathers. Yeah. And it, you know, it's an, there's something about this particular moment which makes it a provocation. Mm -hmm. I think. What, well, I'll, I'll let you talk about it, but yeah. what you do with it. Yeah. Um, provocation is right. Uh, I was not. I mean, you know, I grew up in the 70s. Yeah. Um, it, uh, the, the, the idea of kind of progressive, liberal, kind of gender politics mm -hmm. never entered mm -hmm. um, our conversation. Uh, but I, I, I wasn't, so I said that boys need fathers. I mean, I also said that, that young women need fathers. But I, I thought that what I meant was that there's a certain kind of modeling that a young person can um, benefit from, mm -hmm. uh, and the and then the, the the argument is that if you don't have a f father, I mean, I think also I was responding to this notion that I heard all while I was growing up is like, y'all don't got no daddies around, right? You know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. the reason y'all going through all of this is because nobody got no daddy, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so that really made me think about well. Well, how does one survive when they don't have a father? And right. what is the necessity of a father? And what can a father give you? And what do you need to, like, push back against? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, 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 I guess the, the danger of, of um, writing in today's um, uh, culture is that you... I, okay, so I think there's a couple things. I think, one, you, like, as a writer, you kind of owe it to the, the reader to show them your way of thinking. Absolutely. So yeah. even if it's not the most uh, contemporary way of mm -hmm. thinking, you have, but then you also owe it to yourself to reevaluate right. that line of thinking as well. But if everyone just goes with what the moment is and we don't actually see growth yeah. of an artist. Well, I actually thought part of what made it so powerful is mm -hmm. that you make this statement and then you have this journey with the multiple men who functioned as fathers. Yeah. And there's nothing, and you talk about love, but it's mm. nothing as romanticized. Yeah. Right? No. So there's all these questions that you raise about masculinity, about the ideals of patriarchy, mm. in the presence of love, so that what the initial statement reads as is, 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 compli is complicated and deepened by virtue of... Yeah. The journey you take so that the relate, so it's like, it's not like these are idealized fathers, but these are human beings who are right, worthy yeah. of recognition yeah. and love. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's how I. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you got to be able to see, uh, you know, I think one of my writing principles is you have to be able to see the complications in the other, but also you need to be able to see them in yourself. Yeah. Um, and so I, I take that as like a, a standard. I see a few of my students here. I'm sure I've said that in the classroom. Like mm. if you can critique the other, you also have to be able to turn that lens back on yourself. And that, that takes a lot of compassion to do it on the other. And then it takes, I guess, compassion, but also a kind of, I don't know if bravery is the right word, but maybe a little audacity to mm -hmm. do it uh, to yourself. Mm -hmm. And yeah. vulnerable. I mean, you, you, you go <laughs> through a series of your personal relationships, romantic relationships, and yeah. actually give space yeah. for those past partners to talk back to you yeah. in the text. Yeah. Um, How was that? That, uh, the, the, the doing <laughs> it <laughs> was uh, uh, tough. Yeah, I mean, of course. But I feel uh, like I don't even have the necessarily the place to say it was tough because it was much more tough for, for them, them, I imagine, mm -hmm. to do it. I will say that what I didn't realize is 
I had never read uh, their responses in uh, typeset form until I was reading the audio book for this. Oh. And uh, so I had to read everything. And also I didn't realize how much actual space it takes in the, in the book. Yeah. So it's like, you know, pages and pages and, and pages of this, um, which, you know, it, 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 it's a different feeling when I have to read it and then it, there's no break. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. um, but but then I think, you know, the other thing is that it might it probably didn't feel like a break for them either. You know? mm -hmm. So it's almost like a form of justice that mm -hmm. I, I had to read it in that way. And there's a lot you one of the concepts that you work through mm -hmm. all the way through is justice. Yeah. And it's there's law and then there's justice and yeah. they sort of circle around each other. And I yeah. love this part. And it's, it's near the section where you both you move from talking about um Elaine Scarry's The Body in Pain. Yeah, yeah. But you don't, you're not talking about physical pain, you're talking about emotional pain and mm -hmm. the way in which she talks about the incommunicability, like you can't communicate. Yeah. Another person, you can talk about it, but, but you don't know how you they're know. feeling. Yeah. And then Robert covers violence and the word. Yeah. And like, and I thought, oh, that's just, it was just so profound because, you know, he's talking about like judicial decision making words, yeah. but that the word, that language yeah. can be violent for what it does to human interactions. Right. Yeah. Um, I have been thinking a lot about justice, uh, especially reading, you know, I wake up in the morning, I get the alerts like y'all. Um, and, and one thing I was thinking about is all the guys that I grew up with. Um, so in some, this is a, maybe an aside, but yesterday I was on, online and uh, Cheryl Strayed posted something about a guy who had been discriminated against uh, in, in Portland. And she was like, this is a travesty. And, and it was, and he, mm -hmm. he got a, a settlement for it. Um, but I was like, that was my big homie. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Like my big homie in, in other days. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, this is crazy now that my big homie is being championed by <laughs> Cheryl Stray. Uh, but, I, but it made me start thinking about the, our sense of justice in those days. Uh, and, I, and I thought mm -hmm. that guy was like a stand-up guy. You know, there's certain things that you can trust in that world. And also I was thinking how much it would be really hard if I was a hustler now for you to convince me that what I was doing was inherently unjustifiable. Because I think what has happened, among other things, yeah. is that the idea of justice and right and wrong and who can be convicted of what is like all bets are off. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so now, like, I'm thinking, well, what are all these young hustlers thinking if they're paying half attention to what's happening in the oh, world? Oh, like, right. it's lawlessness. It's absolute lawlessness, right? Yeah. And do you, I mean, because this, uh, this is interesting. I want to... I wanted to ask you, because, I mean, you, uh, among the, and this is not so much a provocation, mm -hmm. but a kind of revelation, like, for so many people of our generation, I'm a little bit older than you, but not that, like, we're very protective of hip-hop. Yeah. We're very protective of, like, you know, being subject, like, our stuff being subject to criticism that the larger society doesn't yeah. get, right? But you, you call, call yeah. our stuff out. Yeah. Right. And but it's not it's not moralizing, yeah. but you're just kind of like, you know, this is this is this right here. These are not great values yeah. <laughs> this right here. This is not cool. I mean, right? like Snoop, like, right. come on, dog. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I was raised on Too Short. I mean, it's probably not a lot of people I ain't in this tripping room no more. who know who Too Short is. <laughs> I mean. Uh, you know, I was raised on iced tea, like six in the morning, police at my door, you know, fresh and deep squeaking across the bathroom <laughs> floor. Uh, and these were before I had an idea of what manhood was. Yeah. I was still developing my idea of, you know, what I wanted to be, of like what yeah. I could be, of, mm -hmm. you know, trying to make sense of what's happening in the neighborhood. And these were, I mean, you know, I had my grandma telling me to read the Bible, but these were messiahs in a sense. Yeah. Um, and then once you got to Tupac, it was like, oh, because dude it, was right. conflicted. Right. Right. Like, 
he had me confused. Mm-hmm. I'm like, is it MOB or is it Dear Mama? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Um, so, but, but yeah, I think, you know, no one is above critique. And I think I... Uh, you know, your heroes, they, they need to be subject to that kind of scrutiny too. And I also know how much we lived by what these men said. And the crazy thing is, they were not that much older than us. No. So they didn't really know what the hell they were saying anyway, right? So, so it's, you know, uh, there's a lot of troubling things, but then also so much inspiration. Like I, I literally listened to Young Jeezy for the last day and a half, uh, telling myself, myself, stories about stuff I probably shouldn't be thinking about no more. Um, but for Jeezy, like I, someone asked me uh, the other week, like, well, who are you writing for? And I usually say I'm writing for a kind of 20 year old version of myself. Mm. You know, someone who mm-hmm. was inquisitive, who had a little sense, who hadn't read all the right books, but you know, and also loved hip hop. And I was thinking I'm writing for the person who thinks reasonable doubt and uh, Thug Motivation One on One are classic albums, but also believe that Go Tellin' on the Mountain and uh, Sula yeah. are also classics. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because one of the things I remember saying when, um, like, the kind of urban lit world exploded, yeah. I was like, for the most part, it's not everything. Mm. It's not as literarily sophisticated yeah. as hip hop, yeah. right? But in and, 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 and lots of just both in terms of like the art and the language, but also the drawing on sources. And there's yeah. a way in which you do that. Yeah. Like you compose from all of these, which is the genius of yeah. the form. Yeah. Yeah. Um, man, I don't think. I think if you what I would hope that I have accomplished or approached in this book is what Black Thought did in that 12 minute <sighs> Uh, freestyle, freestyle on uh, Funk Flex uh, two years ago, I think it was. Yeah. If you have not seen that, you need to watch You should it. need to go home yeah. <laughs> and watch. It is the greatest freestyle that I've ever seen. Uh, and I watched a lot of freestyles. And it is, he is a PhD, mm-hmm. right? Like in travel, in intellect. And he's also from Philly he's- when Philly was Philly. You know, so like... He's from that too, and to me, that's the brilliance. Like someone, a critic actually wrote me the other day and was like, he thought that this was close to kind of like, uh, I think he said to pimp a butterfly or something. Mm-hmm. And I think that, uh, I mean, that to me is a compliment, but I also feel like there's a level in which you can see the places where uh, Kendrick hasn't read deep enough yet or hasn't quite got yeah. that experience yet. Absolutely. Where yeah. Black mm-hmm. Thought is like, He's been doing this 30 years now mm-hmm. and has been around the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Do you, are there, um, are there, I know I'm going to let y'all ask questions. I'll stop you, but, <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, but are there particular books or writers that, I kept thinking about um, Man Child in the Promised Land. Ah, yeah, that's the best title in the world. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as I read, just because in terms of what, you can t- what you do with painting mm-hmm. like a landscape yeah. right but also going deep but are there are there um, works that i mean for for nonfiction, uh i mean man child in the promised land i think um uh i really I, I don't think this was an exemplar but i was really impressed because i knew that he had come from prison as well nathan mccall's make me want to holler oh yeah mm-hmm um, and that was also so much for our generate, like yeah, that coming of eight, the yeah, night. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Perry Thomas, Down These Mean Streets. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's almost like why say Baldwin, because Baldwin is everyone's source, you know. Uh, but also uh, Tony K. Bambara, yeah. I really love. Mm-hmm. Um, if I had to pick a single book, I would say John Edgar Wyman's Brothers and Keepers, though. Yeah. I can say that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah That's yeah. my guy right yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. The way that he writes his brother, mm-hmm. I was like, that's my uncle. That's my uncle right there. Mm. Well, that's all my uncles. Yeah. Uh, you know, the ones that ain't got jobs. 
yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but that yeah, there's beautiful. a and there's a like a the brother is so keen. Mm-hmm. Right, like he's in this place, but he's a philosopher in yeah. this place. Mm-hmm. And then I, I was always thinking how Weidman and his brother seem to me like, like different sides of what I kind of aspired to be. Um, so the brother was like a hustler for a little mm-hmm. while, right? And he was the cool one, and I aspired to that a little bit. But then also I found out about Weidman's, you know, like not only immense talent, but like all these accolades. And I was like, well, there's a model of something. Um, And so I'm I'm really impressed by, you know, I think his, to me, like having a conversation with you is like almost having one with Wyman, the way that your minds are so wide ranging. I'm not just talking about now, but like even when we had the conversation. So, so, you know, it's like, Mm -hmm. you never know, you better not say the wrong thing because you're going to end up talking about some stuff that you're going to have to go and do some more research on. (laughs) You know, because uh, I'll, I'll have a conversation with him and he'll say, like, well, have you read this Spanish author? Yeah. And, you know, I'm reading over here in Portuguese. I'm like, oh, I'm not. I missed that. But, it, <laughs> missed that, but yeah. he's so curious. I mean, you can. That's the, like, that's the thing. Because you each have such a distinctive voice. Yeah. It's a very different voice. But his you can you can read the curiosity through yes. every page. And that's you share that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's always this discovery. Right. And you yeah. feel like go on this journey and come back. Yeah. And it was all for this particular yeah. Yeah, insight. Yeah. OK. Yeah. That's my guy right there. I see that. Yeah. Questions. Um, how you doing? Um, how you doing? My name is uh, Tyler. I'm from Philly, but so I just want to say Philly is definitely still Philly. We're gonna, okay. Just first, right. first, first. It's that Meek Philly now. Oh, it ain't nah, that Black yeah, South nah. Philly. Oh, no, nah, he's still around. Oh, he's still around. We go to the same barbershop. That's the point right now. <laughs> um, so you brought up a second ago about like your question of audience, right? And mm-hmm. like who you're writing for. You said you write a lot of times for your 20 year old self. And so I, would, mm-hmm. I just want to know what would you um, advice, piece of information would you want to give your 20 year old self if you really could now? Yeah. I would try as hard as I could to convince me to read. I mean, I just wasn't reading at all. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I know I had some homework because I was in college, but uh, I, I never, I didn't pick up a book. Um, and I don't know many people who didn't like inherit, inherit money who are successful. Well, I guess you're not even successful if you inherit the money, but. Uh, <laughs> I don't know successful people who don't read. So I would have been pushing it out. But I think if I would have been like, brother, you got to read, then I would not have done it. But somehow I needed that model for myself. And, you know, there's just so much that you can do. I mean, I'm preaching y'all in a damn bookstore. Of course you know this. I'm going to just stop right there. Read. I would have read. I would have read. Huh? Uh, oh, man. The, bo- the first serious book I remember reading was uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain. And uh, I think that's important because I did not grow up on the East Coast. I was not a gay black man. I didn't have a father who was a preacher who was very stern and abused me. So all of those things were very distant from my actual experience. But I read Ball when I was like, I know this guy. Um, so I think that was a lesson in how uh, a book can teach you something about yourself, even if it's not, you know, like I think when we talk about urban lit, like we just want to see the same story of the neighborhood over and over again. I just had this conversation with a person, a librarian in Detroit, and I was like, urban lit is good for telling you what. Um, and a lot of, you know, there's a lot of currency, it's, you know, in rap, like, you know, hey, this happened to me and this happened to me. I was like, but what happens when you run out of the what and you never examine the why or the how? Um, so, so I would push for me to read something that got me out of the what into the why and the how. Hey, oh, there we go. All right, Felice Kuhn, please on your paperback dog. Um, uh, just to piggyback off that last answer, mm-hmm. um, you know, writers that have your background, uh, let's say they were um, for a time. Uh, inextricable from an urban experience. Yeah. Um, you know, in reviews, uh, I've seen what they've done, you know, and it's always the juxtaposition of the former life mm-hmm. and the life now, the one in academia. Yeah. Um, 
you know, it's always that juxtaposition. Could you talk a little bit about um, what commensurate experiences you had in the hood and mm -hmm. in the classroom? Because I, uh, yeah. I know you, ta you taught at Columbia prior to, to Chicago and, yeah. and all the various other places, yeah. you know? Um, you know, can you talk about the sort of the, the carryover between those two experiences or maybe sort of uh, archetypal uh, characters that like, you know, eh, yeah, hubcap. Uh, who, 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 who steals hubcaps? Um, uh, my uncle. In the yeah. uh, in academic spaces. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I think one of the things that is across uh, academia and the life, I'll just call it the life, is a lack of imagination. Um, I have been in uh, faculty meetings. I won't name any uh, institutions. Uh, I've been in faculty meetings, and we got to do like a, some, you know, they make a little small group, and y'all do something. And they're like, well, who's going to write this down? I'm like, oh, I'll write. You know, I, I think my handwriting is okay, so I'll write it down. And then they're like, oh, now we have to share. You know, the person that wrote it should be the person that shares. Okay, that's fine. I'll be the person that shares. And then I'll finish, and then... Uh, you know, a colleague will come over and like, oh my God, that was like really articulate. I was like, well, damn. Like, well, what did you think? Like, I thought we was all English professors in here. <laughs> so, uh, but I think that is a lack of imagination on their part. Like, they can't fathom that the guy, like, I've never gone with the, you know, I never gone to a meeting dress like I sh probably should have. You know, I probably could have got promoted a lot quicker if I would have got me some button downs and some nice khakis. I just, I didn't, I didn't do it. Um, but I think also there's a lack of imagination in the hood because they only think of like very narrow ways of making it. And the metric of how you judge success is very um, narrow. Even the metric of success in academia is really narrow, right? Like, try to get, you know, a tenure or a name professorship. Like, it's a very restricted, you know? Like, they're trying to keep as many people as they can. I guess that's the other thing, too. It's like, you got to watch out for the haters, right? Like, whoa, you thought they were your colleagues, but they in there like, I actually didn't think that paper was all that great, <laughs> you know? They published in this journal, but I was in the such and such journal. Like, I can just imagine. I mean, I'm, I don't have that level of hate in me, but I can imagine that in those meetings for tenure, they're like, Psh, New Yorker? Psh, really? That's what you got? Um, and the same thing happens, you know, if you're competing for finite resources, which is what happens if you're a person of color in academia. Like, what is it, 3% black people in academia? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. same thing with the small resources in the hood. Like, everybody can't have a good plug. Right. How are you going right. to get it? That's right. Hey, Mitch. <laughs> it's me. Oh, oh what's up? <laughs> I, so, so what started you reading? I have, a, you know, my challenges with my son who <laughs> does not like to read. So yes. what would be your advice to get him, you know, into oh, that? Oh, ma'am, you don't want to hear mine. I was in prison. Uh, I mean, you know, but I was thinking, like, how do you can because because clearly guys read in prison, you know? But how do you get them to see time on the outside that there's a, there's a value in taking that time for yourself and reading? That's not helpful for you, obviously, and little Gav. But, um, I mean, I think it's just modeling, right? Like, I didn't, I, my mama claimed she read books. I never seen my mama pick up a book. I never seen my mama pick up my book. <laughs> that ain't no lie. So, so... The only person I ever remember reading throughout my childhood and into my early adulthood was my grandmother, and all she read was the Bible. I'm sorry. That? My father read the Quran, and my great-grandmother read the Bible. I mean, that counts. That counts, yeah, yeah, but we didn't have no bookshelf. We're, okay. <laughs> Can I say something really quick? Because yeah. one of the things I say all the time, and I've worked really hard to cultivate readers, mm -hmm. one I've got, one I'm still working on, but <laughs> is that... It's because it's a muscle that if you just, if it's 10 minutes a day, like it just is hard to, call, it's like anything else, but people think you're just supposed to love reading for an hour or two hours. And it's not like that. Like, but if you can get a kid to read for 10 minutes a day, it'll inch up and then also let them read whatever they're interested in. Don't judge if it's a comic book or it's a chapter book. Read all reading is good. 
That's my two cents. I got it. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Is we supposed to be done? No. Are we done? Oh, we, <laughs> I, one more question. It's from me to her. Uh, damn, where, oh, man, come on. Oh, well, there it goes. All right, there it goes. There it goes. Provocation. Here we go. Um, here's a confession. Recently, I have wondered if white people are irredeemable. I've been wondering the same thing. Let me tell you. Cert, not everyone as a collective, obviously. Right. Well, no, and it's just so funny. So Emily Robinson asked me that about that same sentence two days ago. Yes, that's my people. See, we're yeah, thinking see. alike. But and you know, I for me it was a moment of honesty, yeah. right? It's like you know, because I, I mean, how long? I mean, you know, you think over four hundred years. Yeah. Every possible strategy. Yeah. Everyone you know, assimilation, revolution, so reform, like every single thing. And I think of all those people who died just in the last century. Mm -hmm. And everybody said we had a social revolution and finally the promises of the Declaration of Independence were going to come to fruition. And now we're where we are. Yeah. And it's, you sort of ask, so what, it, what is it gonna take? But the fear for me is I don't want to think that because yeah. I don't want that to have all been in vain. Right. But I. I I have no idea. Like, how, how, how do we convince y'all, mm -hmm. right, not to lock us up and kill us and destroy the planet yeah. and destroy everybody else in the process? And, and because of the fear mm -hmm. of all of us others, be willing to prop up um, a, 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 a psychopathic, antisocial idiot. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's... I think white people are not irredeemable, but white is. White, okay. whiteness. Well, that's, yeah. Right, so to me, right. So, because one of the things, I have all the caveats. I yeah. love lots of white people, so yeah. my best friends are white. Yeah. And it's true. Yeah. Right? No, but I mean it, right? Yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm making a joke, but I mean it. <laughs> but but the, there is the category, and that's why I taught, and the book I also said, I've taught my sons not to love white people as such, mm -hmm. right? Individually, yes. Yeah. But the category has done so much destructive work, right? White yeah. people don't have to be white people. Right. Yeah. They, mm -hmm. There it is there. This is a little nationalist. Oh, well, I don't know. I'm not in charge of the clock, y'all. Uh, Let's okay. his brother ask a question. What's up, Mitch? What's happening? Hey, oh, man, I want to say thank you for all the work. Thank you. Uh, so I was just thinking about like the process you're talking about of coming into literature, and mm. you start to kind of analyze you know, some of the men in your life, the things around you, mm. and how maybe a lot of people are kind of wed to this like patriarchal thinking. Mm -hmm. And so when you start to do the work of kind of starting to unpack that and confront them, you are met with maybe some anger, some confrontation, a mm -hmm. little bit of like disenfranchisement from maybe some people that are close to you. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious what that process of getting past that first confrontation and where that ending point looks like for you when doing that work within your own family. Oh, man, uh, I think there's a way, I, I don't, there's not a lot of confrontation. It's more listening and then showing them back what I think I hear. Um, Cause you can't, I mean, I know what I'm gonna do with my 67 year old uncle, you know, like, but if I, hey, this is what I think. And then I'm, you can, you can read this thing Right, because the other thing is like, clearly it doesn't work, right? Like, you I mean, you gotta really keep, you bumping your head, man, clearly you, you're not making some of the right decisions. So I think if you can just make a person reflect on the actualities of what uh, the outcomes are to this kind of behavior, then unless they're a masochist, like they gotta figure out another way to do it. Um, but yeah, I don't have a lot of, there's not a lot of confrontation in my family, because also I don't, I don't interact with them under the guise that I'm gonna be able to change them. I'm just trying to show them a reflection, usually mine, you know, because like if it's in them, it's likely in me too. Okay, Jared says one more, and he's running things. Hey, Mitchell. How What's are happening? You? So you, you answered the question, why you write? Now, uh -huh. I'll, I'll never forget that quote. You write because you want 20 years from now, people to know that we were here. Yeah. Um, 
why do you teach? And I say this because I want to thank you mm -hmm. for, for that gift of becoming a teacher. You didn't have Thanks. to do it. You could have been a wildly success, successful author. But, you know, your teaching changed my life. Oh, wow. It, like, it gave me the courage to do what I'm doing, which is very hard. Yeah. But what makes you do it? Uh, I will say, Vivian, you was already doing it when we met. But thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so the honest truth is I didn't get into teaching because I thought I had an aptitude for teaching. I got into teaching because I had a criminal record, and I figured out they wasn't going to do no background checks at the university. <laughs> but it's also kind of how I got into writing. I'm like, well, is, I'm, I didn't cut down my options now. Like, what we got? Uh, they told me I could journal well, so maybe I'll try this writing. But once I got into it and I discovered that I had an aptitude for it, then it became, well, how do I get better? Um, and I think uh, probably now teaching is a passion that is maybe second to writing um, because I, I do like being in the classroom. And what I like most about it is that I'm constant. It's like they're paying me to go to school. You know, like, I learned so much from you. I learned so much from Chelsea. I learned so much from everyone that I've been in a, in a classroom with. So it's like, oh, this is the real hustle right here. Like, I can be a lifelong student and get paid for this. Like, that's why it's only 3% of us in this. They haven't even found out about the hustle yet. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you all for coming out. Um, we'll be back in about a month, um, but there will be a short signing um, following this. <laughs>